<clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. We've got a really good study today. I want to do a contextual study of the first epistle of John. It'll have to come in two parts. Um, the reason why I want to talk about this is I've seen people take, take passages out of this epistle and, and just use them out of the context of the letter and come up with completely different opinions than what the other chapters say. And it's just really grievous to me to, to see people do that. And so what we want to do is we want to start in the first chapter and just go through to at least to, through the third chapter today and uh, see what the message of John is. Because this book, though very small, only five chapters, this epistle has such a complete picture of God's plan for you that it's unbelievable that someone could read that epistle and come up with something completely different. It's just like the book of Romans. The book of Romans is, is three times bigger than this book. But it's got a complete picture of God's plan for you. And so that's what I wanted to do. Uh, I've had it in my heart for a very long time to teach or to have a contextual study of the first epistle of John. Um, what we're going to look is chapter 1, and what we're going to look at, what we want to learn from chapter 1 is he, he talks about how this life, eternal life, is in God's Son. But it's only given to those who walk in the light. So there are conditions, and we will show you from the Scriptures, that there are conditions to receive eternal life as a gift. Okay, We can't earn it. It is a gift. We can't work for it. We can't be good enough to receive it. But we can do what He has laid out for us to do in 1 John 1. Okay? So here's 1 John 1. We want to look at eternal life is in Jesus. In verse 1 it says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, and we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled the word of life. So he's talking about Jesus. Jesus was the, the word of God manifest to us. He came from God. He was called the Word in 1 John 1. He's, his message is very much the same in his epistle as it was in the gospel that he wrote. And so he's saying that we saw the Word of life that came from heaven. We looked upon Him. We handled Him. We touched Him. We seen Him. And he says, For this life was manifested, and we've seen it. And we bear witness and show you that eternal life. He's just saying that Jesus Himself was eternal life to all those that received Him. And he says, we show you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. So he's saying that Jesus, who was the Word and who was eternal life, was with the Father and he was manifested to us down here on earth in the, in the face of his Son, Jesus Christ. And he says, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that also... That, that ye also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Now look, I didn't color this, but I'm really feeling this verse 4 right now. Okay? These things I write to you that your, more, that your joy may be full. Now you know what He's saying to you? He's saying life is not life without Jesus. You know what the Bible says about us if we don't know Jesus? We're walking dead men. That's what it says. Life is not life without Jesus. You can't know joy. You can't know joy without Jesus. Okay? And so he's talking here in, in this verse 3. He's saying that he, he seen Jesus, he heard Jesus' words, and he says this is all about bringing us into a re relationship. When you're having fellowship with God and His Son Jesus, you're in a relationship with God through His Son Jesus. And he's saying we want to share this message with you so you can come have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with God and Jesus. That's what he's saying. In verse 5, he said, then this, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Now this is what he wants you to know about God. There is no wrongdoing with God. There's no darkness with him. Now the next question we got to ask before we continue to, to, to read the rest of this chapter, we got to know what is darkness and what is walking in darkness. Because this is what he's going to address. Well, Ephesians 5, verse 3 through, through 5 is the simple answer, or 3 through 8, um, all the way down to verse 9. I took some from a modern version because when he talks about the sin list, I want everyone to know what he's talking about. Sometimes the King James Version, people read a, ver a word and they say, I don't know what that is. Well, a modern version might explain that a little better. So we took this from God's Word version. 
Ephesians 5, verse 3 through 5, he says, Don't let sexual sin, perversion of any kind, or greed even be mentioned among you. This is not appropriate behavior for God's holy people. You know what can make you unholy? Doing that stuff. These kind of sins defile man. Make him unclean before God. And so he's saying, don't let it once be named among you. It's not right. He said, it's not right that dirty stories, foolish talk, or obscene jokes should be mentioned among you either. Instead, give thanks to God. He's saying the mouth was created to praise God. Not to, do, to say nasty and dirty things inappropriate things for Christians. It's not for that. It's not for cursing. It's for praising God and giving thanks. He says, You know very well that no person who is involved in a sexual sin or perversion or greed, which means worshiping wealth, can have any inheritance in the kingdom of God, of Christ or of God. Now, do you hear him? He's saying you cannot go to heaven and do these things. He's talking to Christians. That's who he's talking to. He didn't write the Word of God to the world. He wrote it to the church. This is the church at Ephesus that got this letter. Okay? And so, he's saying Ephesians 5, verse 6 through 8 here. We took this from the King James Version. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things, these kinds of sins, come the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. If you're doing these things, you're in disobedience to God, and God's wrath comes upon you, and anybody teaching something different than that is deceiving you. And that's what he says, let no man deceive you with vain words, because of these things, the wrath of God's going to come upon you. You are a child of disobedience. And so he says, don't be partakers with them. Don't be partakers with them, because you were sometimes in darkness. Now that's what darkness is. When we were in darkness, these are the kind of things we did. But now you lie to the Lord. He says, walk as children of light. Or, or as it says in Ephesians 5, once you lived in the dark. Okay? Verse, this is from a modern version. Verse 8. Once you lived in the dark, but now, are ye, but now the Lord has filled you with light. Live as children who have light. Light, verse 9, light produces everything that is good that has God's approval. And that is true. Now, this is his answer. Here's your answer to what darkness is. What he says, light produces everything that is good, that, that has God's approval. And this is true. That's what light is. Darkness is everything that the devil has, has done with this world and his kingdom. The evil that is in the world. This, the transgression of God's law that is in the world. That's darkness. Sin is darkness. It's not having a wrong ideal. Okay? That's not darkness. Darkness is the things that he's talking about here that he ascribes as, as walking in darkness. See? When you were in darkness, you did these things. This is a verse that helps us understand that darkness is sin. Okay? Now, this is what he says in John 1, verse 6. Now, I want you to see that every one of these verses begin with if. And if implies condition. Okay? If implies condition. If we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. He's saying that if you're doing those walking in darkness, what we read from the, anything like that in a sin list, and say you have fellowship with God, you just think you've got fellowship with God. You don't have fellowship with God. People that have fellowship with God, who are in a relationship with Him, they, don't, they, they hate those things like Jesus hates those things. They don't want any part of that to be part of their life. They love God and they want to please Him and walk in His ways. We have the light of God on the inside of us. We can't do that kind of stuff. Okay? And so he's saying that if we say we have fellowship with Him, walk in darkness, we're lying and not doing the truth. But he says, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, just like Jesus is in the light, we're walking in the light, we're following Him. He says we have fellowship with one another. We don't divide. That's number one. But also the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. So I want you to focus in on what the promise is here. If we walk in the light, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. It proves it's not a perfect walk. The Bible does not teach us we have to be sinless. Walking in the light's a way of life. It's a way of life for people that, that love God or are in a relationship with God. They walk in the light because they are in a relationship with God. 
They don't walk in darkness because they're in a relationship with God. And so that is the reason. And so he's saying he has no ideal about us becoming sinless. We are trusting in Jesus for, for our salvation through redemption. We're following Him by walking in the light. We're following, walking after His commandments, like it says in the third epistle of John. And, and then the blood of Jesus is cleansing us from all those mistakes as we trust and try. Okay? This is something anybody can do. Anybody can trust in God to, to redeem us through His Son Jesus and try. Anybody can do that. Anybody can try. And so He's saying if you're trying, then the blood of Jesus cleans you from sin. It shows that it's not a perfect try. The blood is cleansing all your mistakes. But... But you don't get up in the morning with some ideal that it's okay for you to walk in darkness. You get up in the morning knowing that your heart... You know what it is when you're in a relationship with Jesus? I'm going to tell you because I know, because I have a relationship with Jesus. When I get up in the morning, my thoughts turn to Jesus. When I rise up. If I wake up in the night, I might not be awake but just for a, a moment. But my thoughts turn to Jesus. See? Now I wake up a lot at night. Because me and Cindy's got this little conflict thing going on. See? I snuggle while she's asleep. But then when I snore in her ear, she wakes, wakes her up and she pushes me off. I wait for her to go back to sleep and I snuggle again. And then I snore in her ear and it wakes her up. So I wake up a lot at night. I'm a snuggler and I'm going to get it one way or another. I'm going to snuggle. But I can't stop my snoring. So... We got, a little, we got a little cyclic crisis going on here. So, um, but when I wake up at night, I am go my thoughts turn to Jesus. They do. From whatever time I'm awake. It's the same throughout the day. Your thoughts turn to Jesus. When you're in a relationship with Him, Jesus is life. He's saying the things He teaches you is so that your joy may be full. Life is not life without Jesus. It's just not. And so, if we walk in the light, the blood of Jesus cleanses from all sin. He's saying if you say that you have no sin, you're just going to deceive yourself. And the truth's not even in you. That's not even something you can do while you're human, is get to a place where you have no mistakes. Okay? You can't do that while you're human. But he says if we confess our sins, that's a condition. So you're, this is the relationship. He's the Savior. You're the sinner. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And so this is what Jesus is saying. Talk to me about the mistakes you make and I'll forgive you about the ones you don't even know you're making. So it's not about, it's, it's never been about, about trying to, to look at the law of God and, de and determine every mistake that you're making and repent of every one of those mistakes just so you can be saved. That's not the deal we got. Repentance, living a penitent life is a way of life for the Christian. This is the way it works. You serve Jesus because you love Him. Keeping His law is the, very, is the very expression of that love. And the mistakes we make, the Holy Spirit is going to bring guilt upon you when you're quiet. And you have to talk to Jesus about it and clear this up. And he, that's the relationship. That's what it is. And so, he's saying that you, you just talk to him about what you know you're doing wrong, I'll forgive you of everything. If we say we've not sinned, we make him a liar. He's just saying, you're, his words are not in you. He's just saying, you're not going to get to that place. You're not going to get to the place where I don't have sin, or I haven't done that, or I haven't made any mistake. It's not going to be like that. So this explanation shows being in a relationship with Jesus, walking in His ways, walking after His commandments, and talking to Him about our mistakes is a condition of this forgiveness. Now, do you see that? Confess, He's just and faithful to forgive. It's a condition of that forgiveness. Okay? And so repentance is just not a search for every violation. It's not a search, it's not a search for every violation, confession, and correction of every single sin to be saved. That's not what it is. Repentance and confession is part of the relationship it's a way of life where we are forgiven of the sins we confess along with the ones we don't even know about. Okay? That's what it is. It's a way of life. Now, chapter 2. Jesus made the payment for our sins on the cross. He will cover those who are in a relationship with Him. 
Now let's just look at all these wonderful things he's saying. But you know what? I mean, I, I'm just, I'm put out with people that will quote the things that are, are sound really nice and then just leave out all the parts where they're supposed to make any changes. You know? It's like they want Jesus to do all the dying. That's right. But you know what? The, the new birth is the beginning of the death of the old man for the rest of your life. That's what that's supposed to be. Okay? And so when we look at this in 1 John 1, it says, My dear children, I'm writing this so that you will not sin. Everything we received is to change our hearts, to change the way we think and act, uh, to bring us into this relationship with, with Jesus where we want to follow Him and want to do right, even if we don't have the power to do that perfectly. And so we discover that through the agents of the Holy Spirit, changes are being made through the strength that we get from, 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 uh, from God, uh, through, the, through the Bible says we're strengthened with might on the inner man, this is, we find that, that even the good things we do, the change we make, is God living and working through us. And so God wants to take credit for redeeming us and for changing us. And He does that through the agency of the Holy Spirit. But we have a, we have a say in that. We can rebel. We cannot want to do it. We can lust after other things. What happened, see, to the, to the seed among thorns? It lusted after other things, didn't it? And so it became unfruitful. Okay? And so he says, I'm writing this so that you will not sin. Yet if anyone does sin, if he makes a mistake, we have Jesus Christ who has God's full approval. He speaks on our behalf when we come into the presence of the Father. So we have this advocate when we pray to God. Jesus is right there. He's, the, he's our Redeemer. He had no sin. He, he, he lived a perfect life. And then He died for sin. So he can, make, he can make atonement for any sins you commit. But we're in a relationship with Him. And so we're not supposed to sin. But if we do, we have this wonderful advocate that we're in a relationship with. And so in verse 2 He says, He is the payment for our sins. Jesus Himself came into the world for this purpose, to redeem us from all iniquity. And so this is offered to everyone, not for our sins only, but the sins of the whole world. This is an offer to everyone, but everyone will not be a partaker of it. There are people in the church that believe that will not be a partaker of it because they don't have a relationship with Him. That's why. And so when we look at what He says here, back to the King James Version in verse 3 through 6, Hereby we do know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. Now I'm going to tell you right now, this word know... 1097, it means to have a true and, true and personal relationship with Him. I have that for you right out of Strong's, right here. This out of Bullinger's. I mean, it denotes a personal and true relationship between the person known and the object known. That's what Bullinger says. And so, you want to know if you're going to be redeemed, if He's going to cover you these sins for you, you got to be in a relationship with Him. Hereby we do know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. So this word keep here... It doesn't, mean, it doesn't mean to obey perfectly. And it's important what it does mean. It's 5083. It means to guard from loss or injury, properly keep an eye upon, to hold fast, to keep or uh, preserve or watch. So the, 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 what I'm trying to say is, you know, people, people preaching today, they are trying to constantly seem to be releasing people from any obligation to do what the Bible says. Just believe. That's the kind of the hogwash that you're getting. Okay? Well, he's saying somebody's got to stand up for what Jesus commanded us. Somebody's got to stand up. He's saying you guard that. You keep that from energy. You, you honor that. You live by a code with Jesus. You don't get up in the morning with some ideal that you're going to, to please yourself or live in the pleasures of sin. You get up with some ideal that you're in a relationship with Jesus and you want to please Him. And you're going to do that with whatever strength that, that God from above can give you to do. That's the relationship. So if you want to know if you're in a relationship with Jesus, how do you feel about those commandments? How do you feel about that? You think you can just walk in sin, walk in darkness, and you're okay? It's not going to work out for you. I'm telling you, it's not going to work out. He says, But whosoever keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. This is where the love is working. You're expressing your love by keeping His commandments. He's expressing His love to you by redeeming you through His Son. It's a perfect, good, loving relationship. But you're going to be, it's going to be two-sided or it's not going to work out. Hereby know we that we are in Him. 
you got to be in Jesus and Jesus has got to be in you. He's saying if he's in you, it's evidenced by the way that you're living. How you feel about those commandments. And that's why I think this word keepeth is important. Because you know that's what he's expressing. Is how you feel about those commandments. We already know we can't obey that perfectly. Now listen, there is another Greek word that means, that's often translated in the King James Version, committeth. That does mean to practice. So the ideal of practicing the commandments is there too. Sometimes it's, it's translated committeth or commit. Sometimes um, it's, it's translated uh, do. Like in other words, if, you're, if it's doing a positive thing, if you commit sin, then you're practicing sin. That's what the ideal is. Or if you do, you know, uh, uh, do the things of God, then it's, it's practice. See? And so whenever we look at things like uh, the works of the flesh, those that do such things, that's practice such things, uh, then they can't enter the kingdom of God. Or he that commit a sin, that means practice sin. Because we just got through reading chapter 1 where everyone has got sin. And so that's not what he's saying. But in chapter 3, he will really bear this out, the difference between who's his and who's not, based by the way that they live and the way that they feel. So if we're in a relationship with him, then we feel rightly about those commandments. We're following those commandments. We're guarding those, protecting those, that that's something that we need to live after. Okay? And so we are in Him. And so He uses this word right out of John 15. We abide. See? He that saith He abideth in him ought to Himself to walk as He has walked. So just like Jesus said, if He abides in you, then that relationship is going to provide this sap through the Holy Spirit, just like in that vine and the branches. And it's going to bear fruit. It's going to bear fruit naturally because you're in a relationship with Him. And that's just what's going to happen. So if we're abiding in Him and He's abiding in us, it's going to come out in the walk. That's what He's saying in verse 6. He that saith he abideth Him ought also himself to walk even as He walked. So it's going to come out in the walk if you have a relationship with Jesus. It's going to come out in the walk. And you know what? There's nothing else that it can come out as but that walk. It's natural for that walk to be according to what Jesus' will for you is. It's just natural. Just like the fruit in that John 15. Okay? So we just want to bear out, this is what chapter 2 is teaching. And um, as, we look at, as, as, as we look at what he's saying about having an advocate, he's saying that he's going to pay for the sins of those that are in a relationship with him and he knows who that is by what's in their heart and how they walk. And that's the way it's going to work out. You either got a covering based upon that relationship you have with him, which is evidenced by your walk, or you don't have a covering. And you'll answer for all your sins yourself. Jesus will either answer for all of your sins or you will answer for all of your sins based upon whether you have a, a Redeemer or not. And that's the way it works in judgment. You can't answer for one sin. The payment for sin is death. We have a full Redeemer paying the full price. See? But He's paying it to those that are in a relationship with Him that is also guarding His commandments and keeping them from injury, knowing that this is what we need to be doing and how we need to be walking. So that's when he's talking about walking the life or walking after his commandments as the way he's put it in his third epistle, walking after his commandments. That's what he's talking about. David, yes? Can you go back just one slide real quick? One slide before that one? No, no, what you were just showing. This one? So I think it's important to note that the commands the Savior gave us were to love your Elohim with all your heart, mind, and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. Mm. Even the Strong's Concordance shows the Greek refers to the Mosaic Law. Savior showed that his perception of what we should be doing is so much more that's like that's like kindergarten compared to what he says we should yeah, be doing. Yeah. It is. It, everything he gives us really hangs on that still. I mean, that's what he's saying. It doesn't matter. Whatever whatever it is that we are told to do that's, that's good, yes. it all hangs up on that. I completely agree. Good deal. Chapter 2 verse 8. This is what he says, and we're looking at the idea to be in Christ is to be called into one body of love, reconcili reconciliation, forgiveness, and fellowship. So this, this slide is actually going exactly where you were saying, Marshall, by the way. And so the verse 8, this is what it says, Again, a new commandment I write unto you, that, and which, is, which thing is true, in Him 
which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. And so when we look at this, he talks about a new commandment, and you know, you might say he's referring to what Jesus told him in, and he wrote in the epistle of John when Jesus said, A new commandment I write unto you that you love each other the way I love you. That's the new commandment that I think he's referring to. So this new commandment, these, these are instructions based upon that what Jesus told him. That we're supposed to love each other the way Jesus loved us. And so he begins to talk to us that way. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother. Now this word hateth means to despise, detest, or to love less even than someone else. So he's saying that if you, if you are in the light and you detest a brother, mm, you know, or you love him less, you treat him less, it's not good. He's saying that, that he said, if you do that, then you're in darkness even till now. That's not what Jesus is about. It's not what he's about. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. And so, you know, this is the kind of, this is the kind of life we can live without stumbling. When we love God and we love our brother, then the stumbling, the stumbling, the stumbling episodes, they get fewer and fewer. Okay? And so this is what this is really what it hangs upon, like what Marshall was saying. And so he that loveth his brother abideth in light, and there's none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because the darkness is blind in his eyes. So this is part of the darkness that he's talking about. This is what Satan would want to do with a spirit of division, with, a, uh, with all the problems that come up in the, in the church that cause divisions and, and brethren to hate one another or to be enemies of one another or to have no forgiveness toward one another or reconciliation toward one another. That's all the work of Satan. That's darkness. And it is listed in the works of the flesh in Galatians 5, all between hate and murder. you got this big long list of human behavior that's just about brethren being against each other and not reconciling, dividing, and all that sort of thing. And so... Um, <clears throat> chapter 2, verse 12 through 17, we want to talk about the overcomers a little bit. He says in verse 12, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, Father, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. So if we just look at what he's talking about, what he's driving at, these are people in the church that their sins have been forgiven because they're the, they're the overcomers here. See, they've overcome the wicked one and they know who God is. They have a relationship with Him. That's why He's saying their sins are forgiven. Because they have done this. They're in a relationship with God. They've overcome the wicked one. They're not walking in darkness. That's why He's talking about all this stuff. You can't walk in darkness and have a relationship with Him. That's how He started off this epistle. If you walk in darkness and say you have a relationship with Him, you lie. You don't have a relationship with him. You're just tricking yourself. And so that's how this letter started. So we're just looking at the facts of what he's saying. You overcome the wicked one, you know him, then you're forgiven. Okay? And so he says, I've written unto you fathers because you have known him that was from the beginning. <clears throat> I've written to you young men because you are strong. Now this can come through, through, through strength that Jesus gives us. Okay? And the Word of God abideth in you. So the, just like the Holy Spirit abides you, the Word of God abides in you. And ye have overcome the wicked ones. He says this twice. You think that might be important? You've overcome the wicked one by the anointing and by the Word of God that abides in you. And he's going to talk about the, the anointing also in this text. So this is what he says to us. Love not the world... Verse 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If, the, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now he's talking about a particular sphere of the world. So this is what he says, For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. This is not of the Father, but it's of the world. So when he's saying if you, if you are full of lust, whether it be of the flesh, of the flesh of the eyes or the pride of life, the love of the Father is not in you. That's not who he is. That's not who his children are. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abides forever. So this is the target, uh, this is the target people that he's talking to. The ones that are doing the will of God. And if you are walking in the light, walking after his commandments, 
you're doing what you're supposed to do. You're not supposed to become sinless. You can't do that. You know, but it's about the relationship. So the, the subjects of this letter have overcome lust, pride, and the power of sin to rule them or to have dominion over them. That's a verse in Romans 6, verse 14. They are in a place where sin does not rule them or have dominion over them anymore. Okay, there's a difference. We either service to sin or service to Jesus with mistakes along the way. But we're not servants to sin anymore. It doesn't have dominion over us anymore. We may sin through weakness, but if we are not servants of sin, it does not rule over us or have dominion over us anymore. That's been broken. Okay? Now, eternal life is, a con- is, eternal life, um, is conditioned on maintaining a relationship with Jesus. Now, that's what the rest of this chapter is about. It's conditioned upon that. That's why when chapter 1, it starts off with all those ifs. They're conditions. Okay? And so when he looks at when we look at verse 24, it says, Let that therefore abide in you. Same thing he taught us in John 15 in the vine and the branches. He says, if if you if you don't abide in the vine, then the branch is withered and is cast forth and piled for men to burn. And so that that's breaking a relationship with Jesus. And so he says, Let that therefore abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning. And if that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye shall continue in the Son and the Father. Now you hear what he's saying? There's the Word that abides in you. And he says, if you hang on to that, believe in that, let it live inside of you because it's a living Word, you'll continue. You'll continue to have this relationship with God and, the, and His Son Jesus. And this is the promise He's promised us, even eternal life. Now I've, I've heard people just really just quote that one verse and forget about the relationship part. I mean, I'm serious. I mean, they post that and everybody starts cheerleading. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you right now, a post like that on Facebook, everybody starts cheerleading and it's like, forget about the relationship. I'm telling you, they don't, they're not teaching that. They're not teaching that part of it. These things I've written to you concerning them that seduce you. They should put that with that verse. Somebody's getting seduced here. And so he's saying, he's writing this stuff because people are seducing them. There is eternal life for those that have the Word of God abiding in them. That's who it's for. Those not walking in darkness. Those who have a relationship with Jesus. That's who it's for. And that's why we need to include all of this within the context. In verse 27 it says, But the anointing... So here we have the Word abiding in you, what Jesus said from the beginning. Now we have the Holy Spirit abiding in you. So we have the Holy Spirit and His sword at work inside your life. And that's what's going on here. But the anointing which ye have received of Him, we received that from the same Jesus that gave us those words. If it abides in you, ye have not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and is even as it is taught in the list. This word here is none of this is in the Greek. That's why I put it in italics and underlined it. What he's saying that the Holy Spirit is what's teaching you here, and ye shall abide in Him. We abide in Him, He abides in us. Just like it says about Jesus and the vine and the branches. And so he's saying if you have this anointing, He'll help you understand the Word of God. But you know what you've got to have? A will and spirit. See, the problem is, people love this life in this world. And they want to do their own thing. So they want to look at this promise of eternal life without any of the conditions, because they don't want to meet the conditions. Because their heart is truly not with Jesus. Their heart is with their sins and living in pleasure. It's a heart problem. Okay, that's what it is. It's a heart problem. And so he's saying that this Holy Spirit and His Word is abiding in you. This Holy Spirit is teaching you this Word, helping you understand it, opening it up to you so that you can see it. And he says in verse 28, And now, little children, abide in Him, and when He shall appear, we may have confidence that we may not be ashamed before Him at His coming. He's saying that if you don't abide in Him and Him in you, you're going to be ashamed. You may pretend like you're not going to be ashamed, and you may quote this verse without the rest of it. But you're going to be ashamed. If you don't abide in Him and Him in you, you're in trouble. You don't have a relationship with Him. You don't have a covering. He covers those in a relationship with Him. That's who He covers. And it is 
so that our joy may be full. Life is not life unless you got this. Unless you have all of this. It's not life. It's not joyful. Unless you have all of it. And whenever you have a relationship with Jesus and you love Jesus and you are expressing that love through following His commandments and walking in His ways and walking in the light, however you want to put it, then you can have joy and you don't worry about any of this. This is all warnings to people that don't get it, that are being seduced. You don't worry about any of this. You get up happy and you go to sleep happy. And you trust in Jesus because you have a relationship with Jesus. And you don't worry about any of it. It's all good <coughs> because your heart is right. When your heart's right, you don't have anything to fear. Okay? And so he's going to talk to, to people the next time I speak. He's going to talk about people that are given a spirit of fear. Don't think that that's just a saying. There are demons specifically created for the purpose of creating division and fear. All God ever made was following that was angels, and some of them fell. Where did all these demons and the evil spirits come from? That's Satan's creation. Okay, and so we're just saying these spirits have a specific design to create these kinds of things in you. But the Word of God and the Holy Spirit can take all that fear away. It can defeat the spirit of fear. Because we're standing upon the truth of God's Word. And we believe what God has said. We need to believe it all. And so he says, Now little children abide in Him, and when He shall appear... Okay, we read this. We don't want to be ashamed when He comes. If ye, if ye know that He is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of Him. Now, did you hear him? This is the same exact message from John chapter 3 where he was talking to Nicodemus. He started that conversation off with, you must be born again or you can't go. And then he said, to God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Okay? These go together. The new birth is the beginning of the death of the old man. He's not talking to the people that are walking dead men. He's talking to people that's been born again who have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of them that is evidenced by the fruit that they're bearing and the walk that they're walking. That's who he's talking about. And this is a warning. If Jesus is righteous, you know everyone that is following him and his ways is born of him because it's being expressed in their life. Your life is supposed to be an expression of Jesus Christ. And if it's not, there's been a failure. A failure, a planned failure. Because God planned to do two things, predestined before the world was created. To save us, or like it says in Romans 8, verse, I believe 28 and 29, He predestined that we should be conformed to the image of His Son. And so there's a planned failure whenever we don't, when we're born, when we're born again, or supposed to be born again, and there's no righteousness. See? We're not being righteous to be saved. Jesus took care of that. That righteousness, the saving righteousness, is imputed to us. But this righteousness is something that you do because He lives on the inside of you. Your life is supposed to be an expression of Jesus Christ. So this new birth is the beginning of the death of the old man through the agency of the Holy Spirit, and it will be progressive through the rest of your life. Progressive sanctification of the Holy Spirit. You have become a work of God. Chapter 3, being, being a child of God and being disqualified as a child of God. Now this just makes so much sense and he just talks to us so plainly in this chapter. I want you to look with me. What he says about being called a son of God is, is, a, is a call for purity and obedience and those who refuse don't know him. And this is the way this epistle started and this is the way we're going to end the study today. Those that don't do that don't know him. So when he says in verse 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Don't quote that to me and don't read the rest of it. Because he's going to talk about who's a son and who's not based upon their walk and their behavior. Okay? And so he says, Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. And he says, Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when He shall appear, we shall, be we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. 
He is talking about all the things that are a conditional promise that's being made to us. Now this is his conclusion. Every man that hath this hope that he is a son of God, and we're going to be like him when he comes, every man that has this hope, guess what he does? He purifies himself even as Jesus is pure. That's the message. It's not just, hey, like some fluff? You're a son of God. You're going to be just like him when he comes. No. You know what? That message is hallelujah as long as you have this hope in you and you purify yourself as he is pure. That's, that's who he's talking to. Those that have it and receive it so that they can have Jesus living on the inside of them. And they can have a relationship with Him. That's why Jesus came. That we might know who God is. He was God manifest to us. He taught us to know the Father. He came so we could know the Father. He did not come to save you and let you just do your own thing. That is a lie. That is a seduction that He's talking about. Yes. Yes. I don't even have to look that up to know that's right. That's right, brother. Yeah, right. you're gonna be a your brother to what? <laughs> brother, to, your brother in Christ because of Christ. That's your right. brethren because of Jesus. And so in verse verse four it says, "Those who live sinful lives are disobeying God. Sin is disobedience." Verse five, you know that Christ appeared in order to take away our sins, and He isn't sinful. So He didn't He didn't come just to redeem them, but to change the way we act. That's what he's saying here. He's not sinful. Those who live, now this word, King James Version says abide, so those who live or abide in Christ don't go on sinning. And so you want to know who abides in Jesus and who doesn't? It's those that don't go on sinning. See, that's the practice of sin. Those who go, who go on sinning haven't seen or don't even know Him. So this is what it comes down to. Yeah, we can't live without committing a single sin. He doesn't expect us to. He expects us to trust and try. But if you go on sinning and practice sin, or you sin willfully, as it says in Hebrews uh, chapter 10, verse 26, you don't know Him. You don't know Him. You've got to practice where you can believe in Jesus and sin. You don't know Him. If you knew Him, you wouldn't even want to live that kind of life. There's no joy in it. Any space between you and God and all, there's no joy, only misery. Sin makes space between you and God. Being outside His will for you makes space between you and God. And it's going to show up. That space is going to show up. Okay? I'm just putting that out there. So this word abide, to stay in a given place, state or relation, that's what we're talking about, abiding in Him. See? Standing and remaining in Him and not, not going back into sin, <coughs> practicing sin from where we came. Who are the covered sons of God? Well, this is verse 7 from chapter 3. Little children, let no man deceive you. We're back to that, are we? Deception and seduction. Let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteous is righteous, even as he is righteous. He's saying, yeah, the, you, the imputed righteousness, that's a thing. But so is Jesus expressing his life through you. That's a thing too. And if Jesus Christ is expressing his life by living on the inside of you, and your life is an expression of Jesus, you're going to be having some righteousness of your own. It's not going to save you. But you're going to have some. You cannot help but to have some. It is a natural thing that's going to occur because He's living on the inside of you. Just like the fruit of the Spirit. He that committeth sin is of the devil. Now this word committeth does mean to practice. I got that down here for you. To do habitually, to practice, to pursue a course of action. That's what 4160 means. So He's not saying that if you commit a single sin, you're of the devil. He's talking about those that practice sin and claim Jesus. He's saying you, are, you do not have a relationship with Him. He says, He that committed sin is of the devil. You're His child. The devil sins from the beginning. He used to be a son of God too, you know. He was already in heaven where we're trying to go. And He got kicked out for His sin. 
Okay? Just because you get there don't mean you can't mess it up. Okay? This all happened so there would be no more rebellion. He's God. And He has all the joy and good gifts to give. It's a win-win as long as you don't lose by following the devil's example. Okay? So for this purpose was the Son of God was this the, for this purpose the Son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. Jesus, I want you to hear what he's saying that Jesus came into this world not only to redeem you but to destroy the devil's working in your life. And if he's still working, plan failure. Okay? Plan failure. So that's not what he came for. So whosoever is born of God doth commit sin, doth not commit sin. So this is the practice we're talking about. This is the word here, 4160. We don't practice sin. Verse chapter 1 already told us you're not going to get to a place where you don't have any. Okay? But he's saying you don't practice it. So that's what he's talking about here. We can clear this up from simple Greek word studies of what he's saying. Yes. Chapter 1, you're not going to get to a place where you don't need a Savior. You're going to have sin. Confess it. He forgives you everything. Chapter 3, He's saying, you're not going to be practicing sin. You don't practice sin. Okay? So whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For And this is the reason, y'all. He tells us the reason. You know why you don't commit sin? You know why you don't practice it? It's because the Holy Spirit is on the inside of you and you can't. That's why you don't sin. The Holy Spirit is on the inside of you. You cannot sin because you're born of God. You've been born again. You can't permit yourself to just get involved in something that's wrong. you got this on the inside of you saying, stay away from that. That that right there won't make me happy. It'll make me miserable. I've got to do right because I'm going to displease God and I'm going to have to talk to Him about it tonight. I don't want to come down on my knees at my bed tonight and be ashamed when I talk to him. I think about all that stuff when things come up. That's right, brother. Yeah, before it happens, yeah, I'm not going to lose my temper today because I don't want to be ashamed tonight. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. And so, yeah, that day's, that minute's going to come. And when you know that you're going to get down on your knees before your bed that night, you already know. You've got to have that talk. So, you know, he said, Jesus, I'm going to keep my mouth shut like you told me and I'm not going to have that talk. That's right. It can really get to that where you really just don't want to displease God in any way. And for Him to tell you that, that He's displeased with you, you just don't get over that. You don't get over that. It's something that stays with you. You messed up. And He forgives it, but you have trouble letting it go. I messed up. I messed up. Oh, you're talking about a long time ago? But yeah, I messed up. <laughs> he's past that, I promise you. If you've talked to him about it, he's past that. So he says, In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doth not righteous is not of God, neither is he that loveth not his brother. Now he's talking about what darkness is, and walking in darkness, also walking in the light, and having righteousness being produced out of you through the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you. He's saying, look, if you don't have some righteousness, if you don't have some fruit going on, he says, you want to know who's my child and who's the devil's child? You know by their act, by their walk. Now that's how he determines who's redeemed or not. Who's, by, who's his child and who's not? It's by their walk. And if you don't have any, if your life's not expression of Jesus Christ, and don't love your brother, See, these are things people can easily let go of and think they got some of these other little things they're doing that makes it right for them, see? Nuh-uh. Mm -mm. Your life is to be expression of Jesus Christ and this house is God's house. There's to be no division, no refusal to reconcile. No, none of that. He's got rules for that in Matthew 18. And he said, don't you let the sun go down on it. You fix it. He's got rules for that. He doesn't have that in his house. Okay? So we, we see this committeth when he talks to us. It's the habitually, habitually practice, see? The covered sons of God are those who practice following Jesus and don't willfully follow sin and they love the other members of the body. Okay? 
being a true brother. This is what he wraps up this study today. We only got a few slides left. In verse 11, he says, This is the message that ye have received from the beginning, that we should love one another. So that's what Jesus told him, the new, the new commandment, love each other the way I loved you. And so this is what he said, that many things that we do or don't do hangs upon our love for God or our love for our brother. So he gives an example of someone who didn't have a relationship with him, not as Cain who was of that wicked one. So see, he was determined to be a child of the devil because he detested his brother, because his brother did the right thing and offered a blood sacrifice, and he did not. His brother's, his brother's gift was accepted and his wasn't. So he became jealous, divided from his brother. It led to him killing his brother and then lying about it. Well, guess what? The devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. So he's just acting like the devil, and that made him the devil's son. And so he said that he slew his brother, and why did he kill him? Because his own works were evil and his brothers were righteous. It's still that way. The devil's children still kill the Christians. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. He's saying it hated him. It's going to hate you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we, we love the brethren. He that loveth not the brother abideth in death. It's all connected. Whoever hated his brother is a murderer. Because he says that if you hate your brother, you killed him in your heart. That's where murder comes from, is, is hate first. And ye know that no murder hath eternal life abiding in him. So he's talking to Christians here. You cannot be a hater of your brother and expect to go to heaven. Just like you can't walk out to the flesh and expect to go to heaven. You can't walk in darkness and expect to be covered by the blood. The people covered by the blood are the ones he's been talking about for three chapters now. And you know the only way you can miss it? Not read it. Look through there till you find the one that makes you feel all joyful in your sin, that requires no effort from you, and isolate it and preach it as the truth. Because this whole book is about what I'm talking about. This whole epistle is. It's about what we're studying today. Who are the children of God? Those that walk in His ways, walk in the light and not after the flesh. Not in sin. Okay? And so here in verse um, 16, being a true brother, this is what it's like. Hereby we perceive the love of God because He laid down His life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. That's what love is. What Jesus did for us, you ought to love each other that way. Whosoever hateth hath this world's goods and see... So this is the greatest expression of love. This is the least expression. Whoso has this world good and see his brother have need and shut up of his bowels of compassion for him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? So there may be a brother that just needs a meal and you're, not even, you're even ignoring that. So this is the least expression of love to give someone some clothes or some food that, that may be, you know, a brother. He says, My little children, let us not love in, in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and truth. So he's saying, it's not enough just to say I love you. You need to act like it and show it in your behavior. That's what he's saying. Okay? And hereby we do know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. So he's saying there's a test here. You can know you're of the truth when you're acting right towards your brethren. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. He knows everything from the deepest things inside your heart. If your heart's condemning you, then God's going to condemn you too. That's what he's saying. Okay? I think this might be um, getting down close to end. I think we might have a slide or two left. I'm not sure. When the relationship is right, what does it look like? In verse 21, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. So he's saying that knowing that, you're, that you're, you, when you've got a clear conscience, that's a good sign that you're in a good place with God. And whosoever, whatever, because you're in a good place with God, whatsoever we ask, we receive Him because we keep His commandments. You see, he put this back in here, see? We're keeping His commandments. Our conscience isn't condemning us. So we receive what we ask of Him. He answers our prayer. And so it comes back down to this relationship, see, of keeping His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. Our whole life is geared towards pleasing God. And so that's what He's saying. That's the relationship. We do that because we love Him. And this is the commandment that we should believe on the name of, the, of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as He gave His commandment. So this is not the only thing. This is a commandment of commandments, like He said. These are commandments. This is a commandment. 
And so this is an important commandment that stands out, that we need to love each other the way Jesus loves us, see? And he that keepeth his commandment dwelleth in him, and he in him. So again, he's abiding in us, and we're abiding in him, and that we're keeping his commandments. And he said, if you don't, if you say you abide in him, keep not his commandments, you're a liar. That's the way we started off, see? Studying this. And hereby we do know that He abideth in us by the Spirit which He's given us. So He's put His Holy Spirit on the inside of us, and that's manifested by the fruit that we bear. So again, we got this ideal, keep and keepeth, to guard, keep from injury. Probably keep an eye upon, holding fast, preserving and watching. That is the last slide. Well, I think that's all I'm going to share with you today.